Hello everyone and welcome back to the fourth session of the 2018 Small Farms Winter Webinar Series hosted by the University of Illinois Extension's Local Food Systems and Small Farm Team. Uh, this is Zach Grant here again, your friendly weekly moderator and coordinator for the series and the Local Food Systems Small Farm Educator up in Cook County. We really appreciate you all joining us again for these webinars and we're going to do our best to begin and end within the space of this hour. This is a really tight delivery period for our educators to deliver the program, so we hope that you understand we're going to limit your questions to the text box at the left, and I'm going to do my best to make sure that our presenter will answer them more than likely at the end of the presentation, but I'll, I'll provide some links uh, if I can answer the question myself during the presentation. I'm going to post the call-in information in the chat box. If you have any audio issues, you can follow those directions. And additionally, you should have received the slide set for today's webinar yesterday in an email, so you can follow along at home via phone if you have some internet issues. But remember, this presentation is being recorded currently, and I'm going to email the, the link to the archive presentation as soon as possible after we conclude, so later this afternoon. So if we run over on time and you need to leave early, you're, you're going to receive the email with a link to the recorded webinar and any of the answers to any of the questions um, that may have been asked. So there's going to also be a very short online evaluation of, for this presentation with that email. And we really appreciate your feedback and we'll, we'll use it for uh, future webinars. So with that, uh, this week's presentation is from Bill Davison. Uh, Bill is my fellow local food systems and small farm educator and he's housed in Livingston, McLean, uh, and Woodford County unit. Bill's had a really interesting and exciting uh, career path leading him to extension. He, he, he received his bachelor's from, in wildlife biology from the University of Montana, his master's in zoology from Eastern Illinois University, and he's worked as a restoration ecologist for the Nature Conservancy and for the state of Illinois. Uh, for seven years, Bill also ran his own uh, organic fruit and vegetable farm uh, near Congerville, Illinois. His work since starting with Extension back in 2013 has primarily focused on helping farmers adapt conventional farming practices to a sustainable model that both meets growing consumer demand for more healthful food and generates more on-farm income that can keep the next generation on the farm. His most extensive program in this area is the Grand Prairie Grain Guild, which he started back in 2014, and the guild is essentially a network of farmers, millers, chefs, bakers, and consumers interested in creating and expanding markets for organic grain. Bill will elaborate on these projects and others during the webinar, so without further ado, I'll let him take it away. Okay, thank you, Zach, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I am going to talk about the Grand Prairie Grain Guild, which started as a discussion group on Facebook and has now expanded into a diverse coalition. So I would encourage um, anyone who's not a member to join this group uh, if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing. We have 390 members from nine states, so you can join. You can check out all the photos I've taken over the past three years, which in and of themselves are interesting. Um, you can also ask questions um, from the group and get feedback from farmers across the Midwest. Um, about anything you're working on. So we really would like to get um, more members and more engagement on that site. But what I'm gonna do over the next 45 minutes or so um, is provide an overview of the work we've done developing regional food systems for staple crops over the past three years. So when I talk about staple crops, I'm referring to grains, legumes, and oil seeds primarily. I will discuss our work with variety trials, plant breeding, market development, infrastructure development, and farmer training. So the reason we're focusing on staple crops is due to the fact that uh, it's mostly what's grown. They are relatively easy to grow, harvest, store, and market. And these are also the crops that make up most of the food that people eat. So there are real advantages to um, growing them for that reason. They also provide an opportunity for aspiring farmers to get into farming. So one of the more interesting stories um, I've heard recently is about young farmers in Woodford County that uh, have their own company. They run a company and uh, they're not from a farming background and they decided they wanted to start farming. And of course, everyone said, why would you do that? This is a terrible time to start farming. You're just going to lose money. 
So they were discouraged initially. They went to the bank, um, explained to the bank what they were thinking. And the banker said, well, if you are going to do this, you should look into organic farming because right now the numbers, from my perspective, work out better. So they wrote up a budget for an organic row crop, grain farm, basically. They got funding, they got equipment, they started farming, and now they're managing hundreds of acres of land and they actually have to turn landowners away because a lot of landowners now want their land farmed organically. So it is basically the opposite of the conventional side of things where you're competing intensely for land. Um, so there are real opportunities there. Um, and there also are young farmers who are part of a farming family where the, the family may manage thousands of acres of land and they're carving out a few hundred acres, transitioning to organic and, and pioneering these new models for farming. The other thing about staple crops is they provide a foundation and a profit center so that farmers can build diverse crop rotations and run profitable farms that can be sustained over the long term. And so this could allow, provide for farmers the opportunity to grow diverse fruits and vegetables as markets develop and as they develop the skills to manage those crops. So these things are not mutually exclusive and the ultimate goal of the work that we're doing is to develop really diverse crop rotations and fully integrated farms where we have livestock back on the farm, we have tree crops combined with perennials and row crops, fruits and vegetables all grown together. So that is what we are working towards. Um, so here's our logo and uh, some corn roots. Pretty exciting. Uh, this is a poster developed by a young farmer in Northern Illinois that explains what we're doing. The illustrations are from a chef in Chicago. This project started after I read the book, uh, The Third Plate by Dan Barber. And Dan's a chef in New York. He's very prominent in the food world. And he wrote a book outlining what our food system could look like if people ate with farmers in mind and if they ate the products of diverse crop rotation. So this poster is meant to raise awareness about those crops and um, why people should consider supporting them. This is a recent book uh, from David Montgomery, whose previous book was called The Hidden Half of Nature, where he wrote about the microbiome in the soil and our guts. And it, that was a fascinating book. This book is an overview of farms around the world and the way that they, many of them are changing the way they farm to focus on soil health and the benefits that they're getting from doing that. So one of the interesting things about this book is it's pretty straightforward. So um, there are three principles outlined on the left here. Minimize soil disturbance, maximize cover crops, and grow diverse rotations. So those are pretty broad sort of things to aspire to. They don't tell people how to farm. They just tell them um, what to focus on. And so the farmers that are focusing on doing these three things well are seeing organic matter levels in their soil increase over time. And organic matter is the key driver of soil health and the most efficient way to deliver optimum nutrition to plants. So some of the farmers who have done this have gone from 3% organic matter to 10% organic matter um, over six years. So they're adding 1% organic matter a year. That sort of runs counter to um, conventional wisdom, which says that you can't um, increase organic matter rapidly. Which, um, I'm talking about organic matter in the soil. Um, the basic idea is that there are farmers adopting these three practices, increasing organic matter and seeing a lot of benefits from that. So the idea behind this is that if you focus on soil health and make your soil healthy, the soil will feed your crops and you can reduce or eliminate inputs while getting increased yields. That leads to higher profitability. And this book documents how that's happening on farms all over the world. It's not really debatable. It's just the way that biology works. 
so this farm or this book is full of stories, positive stories of pragmatic farmers all over the world, all over this country that are adopting these practices and doing very different things depending on where they're located. So um, there are lots of different ways to do this and it depends on your climate, the markets available to you and your interests. But if you use these as guiding principles, um, it offers a lot of flexibility. One story that I thought was interesting um, in this book is a story of Justice von Liebig, who is a chemist who in 1840 was credited with a move towards um, chemical fertilizers. So sort of he raised awareness about the idea that you could feed plants with chemical fertilizers and a lot of people latched on to that and were excited about it at the time and we basically have run with it and have not looked back. The interesting thing in the book is that he profiles what justice did over the next 23 years, which was con continue to study the soil and wrote a second book in 1863 called The Natural Laws of Husbandry. <clears throat> so in this book, <clears throat> he profiles um, soil organic matter and noted that it played a significant role in nourishing plants. And he talked about examples throughout history of cultures that exhausted their soils and collapsed. And he asked, you know, what the difference is between agriculture that has been sustained versus agriculture that has collapsed. And the difference is the ones that have been sustained return organic matter to the soil. And he goes on to say, um, adding farmyard manures back to the soil maintains fertility and is established by the experience of a thousand years. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So what we're seeing now is um, that, that organic farming has gained enough market share to attract attention from the larger food system. So the label is being co-opted in some ways and watered down, literally, and it's losing its meaning in the eyes of some consumers. So there are a lot of organizations working on establishing an alternative label. This is the Rodale Institute's um, Regenerative Organic Certified. This is a more stringent label that would specify soil health parameters and a lot of the things I just discussed in an effort to help consumers um, spend their food dollars in a way to improve soil health and benefit farmers. Okay, so a lot of what we started out doing uh, was focusing on variety trials. So what you see here um, is our variety trial plot on Harold Wilkins Farm in Iroquois County. So we have replicated trials on campus at University of Illinois and then here on Harold's farm. So we are standing in a failed plot of barley. But the idea behind these trials is that it's okay to fail at a small scale, we don't lose that much and you learn something in the process. So you can see in the foreground a nice stand of wheat and right behind us is a stand of oats. And then the bare soil in the background is where we do the small plot work for um, small grains like wheat primarily. And that is where we learned what works and what doesn't. And um, so I will share with you what has worked. So we've been doing trials and when we started out, a lot of people told us that what we were trying to do wouldn't work, but I had been working with farmers that were already growing these crops, so I knew it was possible. Basically what we did was test it out and um, figure out that a lot of these crops do well and have done well every year. So for anyone that wants to um, learn more and grow some of these crops, this is a short list of some of the ones that have done well for us. And Albert Lee seed um, is a source of seed for most of these. Um, it's just one place to get seed. There are lots of others and I order seed from a lot of different companies, um, but Albert Lee is good to work with. They're very knowledgeable. Um, they have good customer service. So Warthog, hard red winter wheat. Um, Illinois mostly grows soft red winter wheat, not hard wheat, although it, Illinois used to grow hard wheat. Uh, Warthog is a modern variety developed in Canada. It has agronomics similar to modern soft red winter wheat. So it's relatively short, yields well. Um, you can make uh, bread flour out of Warthog 
winter wheat. If you also grow Glen, hard red spring wheat, you can get up to 15% protein in that variety. When you blend the two, you can create um, a consistent all-purpose flour or a bread flour. So that is what um, the mill at Janie's Farm is using. Um, we also have had good luck growing turkey red, hard red winter wheat. This is an old variety. It gets tall. Um, we have learned that it has um, disease resistances that modern varieties don't. So we've had years where side by side, the modern soft red winter gets stripe rust or some disease and it literally um, does not affect turkey red. So the farmers that have grown this um, have been happy. You don't get the highest yield. You do get name recognition and a higher price. Erisman soft red winter wheat is a recent introduction. This was bred by Fred Kolb, the small grains breeder at U of I for organic farms. So it's taller. Um, it stays ahead of the red clover, basically. So you don't have to worry about the red clover, the green matter getting into your combine. Um, and the bakers like to work with it. And we've also been looking into oats. So the Practical Farmers of Iowa is an amazing resource when it comes to oats. You can go to their YouTube channel, um, other outlets that they have, and see interviews with farmers in Iowa that have decided to take a, a grain farm and start growing oats and alfalfa and all of the um, changes that they had to make to do that efficiently. So it's really, um, it's amazing what is available there. And I can say from my conversations with grain millers and breeders and farmers that it is possible to grow food grade oats in Illinois to um, meet the standards of grain millers and other large scale buyers for test weights. You do have to pay attention, you do have to do things right and you have to take extra steps, but those are all the reasons why um, food grade oats are not likely to become a major commodity in the near future. So you will get better prices. Uh, Brissetto hybrid rye. This is a new hybrid rye that yields um, similar to wheat. Um, bakers like it, brewers like it, um, and farmers are happy with it. So that's something that has done well. Dillon rye is an open pollinated version of rye, also does well. There are some perennial ryes out there which are much harder to find, but we are um, exploring their potential. And then Kernza, hopefully most of you have heard of Kernza. This is um, the perennial version of uh, intermediate wheatgrass that developed by the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas over the past 25 years. And Plow, P-L-O-V-G-H, is um, the distribution company out of Wisconsin that works with them. So this is a perennial grain. Um, it has received a lot of interest and in funding from companies like General Mills and Patagonia. It's being grown in larger and larger acreages. They have identified Illinois as one of the best places to grow this, which is not surprising. So they are trying to find more people to grow this crop in Illinois. So I'll, I'll speak about it a little bit later. And then uh, Camelina. This is an oil seed. It's in the mustard family and it has a lot going for it. The picture on the right here is oil out of Canada from some farmers that are growing it. So it's a culinary oil. Um, it's a green that can be um, eaten fresh. Um, the seeds can be used in different ways. It's uh, winter annual. So you can have a green plant growing on your soil over the winter. Um, it helps break up, you know, rotations based on grass. So it's just it just has so much going for it that we continue to work with it, promote it, and try to um, develop market so more people can, can grow this crop. It has been um, developed extensively through the Forever Green Initiative out of the University of Minnesota. And there's an entrepreneur in Chicago who trains Navy SEALs that's developing a nutrition drink based on camelina and other um, crops that aren't corn and soybeans, basically. So there are some markets developing for it. And we also are going to start growing upland rice. So this is rice that does not need to be flooded. Um, shirk seeds in Indiana is a source of seed for this if anybody wants to experiment. My impression at this point is there is no good reason why it will not work. It could be treated like a small grain and we can grow rice in Illinois and supply it to local markets. 
We also um, are looking into crops like um, hullless pumpkins. So basically a pumpkin where the seeds don't have a hull and you can, you, you're selling the seed and not the flesh of the pumpkin. So there are farmers doing variety trials, growing this type of pumpkin and trying to figure out the logistics of planting and handling. Um, and so this is um, likely to develop in the near term. And it actually isn't much of a stretch since we already have a lot of farmers growing pumpkins in Illinois that we could develop a market um, for hullless pumpkins. So this is an image of Kernza. It looks more like a prairie or a hay field than a grain field. Um, and then on the right, you see the image. So it says forage and the seeds below that. So that is what the Land Institute started with 25 years ago. And over the course of 25 years, they've increased seed size to the three rows in the middle. And then the row on the left is annual wheat. So that's pretty amazing progress. Um, and this is what the root system looks like. So if, you're, if you think about your soil and trying to improve the health of your soil, the roots you're looking at here are the kind of roots that built the soil that Illinois has right now, the prairie grasses. So what this shows, if you look at December on the left, you see that little grass with the spindly white roots, that's annual wheat. And then it turns the next to it. And then you go to March and June. So it's a pretty striking comparison. Um, I think I irritate farmers when I say the annual wheat is just wimpy compared to Kernza. But what we're trying to do is develop markets for Kernza, help more farmers grow it, because if you can get that root system in your soil for three to four years, it just has tremendous benefits to everything else you do on your farm. And this is a very flexible crop. It can be a hay crop, it can be pasture, it can be a grain crop. So there's lots of ways farmers can fit this into their rotation and it can be different for different farms. And so you don't have to limit your thinking to the fact that it does not yield as high as an annual grain, but it gives you many other benefits and uh, it gets improved annually. There are breeders in Kansas, Minnesota, other parts of the country that are really focused on improving um, this crop. So this is an image of the mill at Janie's Farm. This is in Ashcombe, Illinois. It's about an hour south of Chicago. And it's one of the most significant pieces of local food system infrastructure in Illinois. So what you're looking at are two 30-inch stone mills and a complete sifting system. So most of what you see is the sifting sif system and the storage. So the the black totes store a thousand pounds of grain and that feeds into the mills. And then there's a vacuum system to suck the flour up a pipe and through a series of screens. So they have the ability to um, sift the wheat down to a very fine, what would be called uh, double O flour, like pizza flour. So they can make it really, really fine. And that, this is a significant investment and all this equipment. There are a lot of mills on farms, but very few of them have invested in this level to be able to deliver commercial quantities of sifted flour to the marketplace. So this farm is 2,500 acres of organic grain, and they have the capacity to mill 8 million pounds of flour a year. They're developing relationships with um, distributors in Chicago, Indianapolis, St. Louis, and building up markets um, for grain and flour. So right now, um, we have succeeded to the point where we are limited by the markets and we're trying to build up markets that pay a fair price for the grain. And as it turns out, a fair price for local organic grain is significantly more than commodity grain. And so we are working on marketing, we're working on distinguishing our product from the mainstream to try to help more buyers understand um, what they're paying for and what they get. And so we're talking about whole kernel flour, which is our way of, of saying, you know, we, we run the whole seed, the whole wheat seed through the mill and bag the flour. So you literally get the whole kernel um, in some cases. So nothing is removed. And that is very different than whole wheat flour, um, which is run through a roller mill has the bran and germ sifted out and then a certain percentage returned back to it. 
So we do have a niche there in terms of delivering fresh flour um, to local markets. And the next step for the mill is to add a dehauler, which is what you see on the left here. And this would allow um, dehauling oats, um, spelt, emmer, einkorn, crops like that, so that they can begin to market the hauled grains. Um, and then what you see on the right is a color sorter. So this is a piece of equipment that if we were to have a wet year and we get high levels of vomitoxin, which is a, a fungal toxin on the seed, this machine can sort it out and take a lot of grain that um, is feed grade or maybe even not feed grade and sort it out and turn it into food grade. So it can add a lot of value and it can help farmers justify um, investing in grow, trying to grow food grade grains. So we're excited about the possibilities with that machine. Okay, so we hosted a um, plant breeding workshop at U of I, and we brought organic um, grain breeders together to talk about plant breeding. And so what I wanna talk about here, so I'm sitting at a table with corn breeders and Walter Goldstein with the Mondaman Institute in Wisconsin, is talking about his 20 decades of work breeding corn for organic farmers. And on the left, the man in the blue shirt with the glasses is uh, Martin Bone. He's a geneticist um, in crop science at University of Illinois. So this moment here is the moment when Martin had a bit of an epiphany, learned what Walter was doing and these other breeders and decided to join us. So he's, he's furiously taking notes. He stops, he looks up and he says, you know, I just need to change the way I think about things. My work can actually help people. Because what he's, what he's doing is, is breeding corn for the big companies. But he realized in listening to Walter that he could breed corn for organic farmers um, that would help them out. So this is the point at which Martin got interested, joined our team, and led our efforts to um, pursue grant funding, which we have since received. So now what's happening is um, soybean breeders are trying to join our project, and we're working with them. And new faculty in plant pathology and soil health are also joining our project. So the main point I want to make here is that the University of Illinois is changing remarkably fast. So um, many of you may lament that it has taken a long time for this change to happen, um, but the fact is it's happening. And so you can all take advantage of it. And so what I would like to convey is that we need to hear from you we, and we will respond. I mean, we have demonstrated that we can respond and that's what this grant is about. So if you have issues that you want to see addressed and you're persistent, we can recruit researchers and faculty and address those concerns. And I can tell you when you get faculty focused on a question, they bring a tremendous amount of energy and resources to bear and we can solve a lot of problems. But that requires many people to think a little differently about the university and what they're capable of. So we need we need people to push a little harder. So we got um, two million dollars from the USDA through the Organic Research and Extension Initiative to breed corn for organic farms. And uh, I've been doing uh, corn trials with open pollinated corn for years. And it's really it's this plant on the left here that got me started thinking about corn roots. This is Chapalote. It's one of the oldest races of corn in North America. It's been around about 4,000 years. It's a brown popcorn and it's a crazy plant. Look at those roots. It has um, the most vigorous roots I've ever seen. And so I started talking to breeders and asking them, wouldn't there be value in incorporating some of this vigor into corn plants? I mean, these plants are crazy. And so, I started doing more reading, talking to corn breeders, and I also learned that our modern yellow den corn, so the corn that covers our landscape, contains 5% of the genetic diversity of the corn genome, which is pretty shocking, shocking to me at least. Um, and the reason for that is because there is one metric 
that is used to breed that corn and it is yield. And so when a new line comes out that gives a bump in yield, all the companies grab it, incorporate it into their breeding lines to get that bump in yield. The problem is when you focus on yield, you lose other things. You lose um, protein, nutritional quality in some cases. And so the niche for this grant is for us to breed corn for organic systems. So we are going to reintroduce more genetic diversity into corn plants and select for um, performance under organic conditions. So what you see on the right, this picture on the right with the corn roots coming down with that clear gel on them, um, that's called exudate. So those are the chemicals, the basically uh, carbohydrate solution that the plants secrete into the soil. Because these roots are exposed, you actually get to see it. But normally this all happens underground. And some corn plants will secrete up to one third of their photosynthetic capacity um, through exudate into the soil. They would not do that if they weren't benefiting from it. And so what we're learning is that some of these old varieties produce a lot more exudate than others. And the reason they're secreting it into the soil is to feed the uh, fungi and bacteria that live in the soil. And they actually adjust the composition of this exudate to favor certain bacteria and fungi depending on their needs. So if they're attacked by insects, they'll modify their exudate, secrete it into the soil, the bacteria will consume it, the byproducts the bacteria produce will be taken up by the plants and will help them deter insects. So there is a very complex interaction going on between these plants and the soil and we understand very little of it. We've only identified about half of the life in the soil I have a very limited understanding of the complexity and the interactions that are happening down there. So that's part of what we hope to learn through this grant. And we're also working to develop new business models. So along with, you know, producing corn plants that do well under organic conditions, we also need to help these private independent breeders find a business model that works for them where they can compete in this marketplace and, um, sell seeds for these plants. So we're focusing on hybrid corn at this point because the breeders cannot see a way for them to profit from open pollinated seeds. So we, I started into this hoping um, open pollinated plants would play a role, but Walter Goldstein and other breeders say that farmers will not grow open pollinated corn because it's variable. And I was shocked by that. So we literally cannot grow open pollinated corn because farmers won't grow it. They don't like that one plant is six inches higher than another. So that's a cultural social barrier that limits our ability to explore genetic diversity. So it's something we're working on, but um, until we make progress in that area, we're growing hybrid corn. This is a visual that shows you uh, one of the traits we're selecting for is, is um, nutrient efficiency or nitrogen efficiency. So um, this shows corn that is nitrogen efficient compared to normal corn that is grown on nutrient poor soil. So basically the breeders have found lines of corn out of Mexico that have the ability to fix nitrogen to form symbiotic relationships with bacteria in the soil and get more nitrogen out of the soil. The other, the other traits they're working on um, are um, what's called gametophytic incompatibility, the GA1 gene. So you see this little cob here of unfertilized corn. Walter Goldstein at Mondaman has been breeding corn that will not accept dent corn pollen. So this is a way to breed organic corn that resists cross-pollination from genetically modified corn. And he's got um, quite a few varieties that are, are working in that regard. So what we're trying to do is put all that together. So we would have corn um, selected for organic systems that resist cross pollination and that, as this image shows, has quality traits that the market demands. In this case, we're looking at high carotenoid corn. So this orange color, which if you put it in poultry feed, gives you the dark orange um, egg yolks you see in the picture there. 
So a project that I'm working on um, independent of our grant is to develop what's called composite varieties of corn. So all these little envelopes you see here are different varieties from the USDA seed bank in Ames, Iowa. And the picture shows the mixture. So I mix them all together, combine them with Floriani flint corn. So these are all flint corns and um, grow them out in my own plots and on farms as a way to explore the potential of genetic diversity. So I basically am mixing about 50 varieties together, letting them freely cross pollinate and uh, trying to pay attention. I'm not a corn breeder, um, but I do know how to grow plants and I do know how to pay attention to plants. And so I'm learning how to select um, vigorous, healthy corn plants. So this is what one of my early harvests looks like. So I'm combining all these different types of flint corn, letting them cross. This was my harvest from this past season. So this is where I'm at now, selecting for red and orange ears of flint corn that tastes really good. So this is not a, a commodity corn. This is corn for um, food grade markets or personal use. And I, I'm really hoping more people will take an interest in this. So this would be a way to show breeders that farmers actually are interested in diversity and they can tolerate one plant being taller than another. But I have quite a bit of seed to share this year. We're moving to larger plots, but I also hold back seed to share with people. And I am looking for anyone, a gardener, you know, you can be just gardening or, or farming um, that would like to grow this corn for your own use. So if you're interested, send me an email or contact me and I can mail you enough corn seed to get started and you can do your own selection and uh, you can have the most amazing um, corn meal for cornbread or polenta, that type of thing. So this combines the genetics of this country, um, Italy, uh, Central America, South America, all, all mixed together and all, all crossing. I'm also working with the white corn, which is what you see here. Bianca Perla on the top, Hickory King in the middle, and some of the ears on the bottom that I'm harvesting now. So this is just um, another effort to work with white corn um, and, and breed that. This is Walter Goldstein standing in uh, the white flint corn. Um, he came to visit my plot, one of my plots, and uh, I thought the corn was impressive, and I thought that I was seeing a lot of vigor coming out of these crossings and, uh, and it, it was doing much better at a high population than I expected. But I don't have a ton of experience with corn. So Walter came and looked at it and confirmed that indeed it does look good. We are seeing benefits from all this genetic diversity. So it is, it's actually working. Some farmers are taking components of this mix um, and growing out in this case, four acres. So one of the things you see here that we're selecting for is what the breeders call stay green. So if you look at the image on the right, that big, broad, dark green leaf, and then if you follow it to the stalk, you see a mature ear of corn there. So this corn from South America is really impressive. It, they're super vigorous, healthy plants. So that's just an example of the, the type of thing we're selecting for in this project. And here, here are our adventurous farmers harvesting their orange flint corn. So we're also working on the marketing side, and that is what this shows. So we have uh, got a lot of support from a lot of different groups, and this is a visual for the Artisan Grain Collaborative, which is a group out of Chicago that is working to develop markets in Chicago. And so the circle of organizations are all groups that are working together um, in different categories to help develop um, new markets for these local grains. This is one of our members. This is Greg Wade with Publican Bakery in Chicago holding a loaf of bread that he's made with uh, local wheat. So it's, a, it's remarkable bread. It, it tastes really good. It has the kind of structure um, and texture that people are looking for. So um, we are not limited in our ability to make amazing bread. 
So through the Artisan Grain Collaborative, we applied for and received a $460,000 grant um, through the USDA, through their local food promotion program. And we are partnering with Brian Jacobson at the Food Pilot Lab at University of Illinois. So what you see here is the Doe Lab 2500 and the computer screen, um, which gives a readout um, for flour. So what we're doing with the Pilot Lab, we're milling certain grains that we're trying to promote in Chicago and getting this sort of data that we share with bakers. And the lines you see on the graph there basically show you the strength of the gluten over time. So you see the peak where it's at its strongest, and then as you continue to mix it, the strength breaks down. So a baker can use this sort of information to determine what type of recipes they would use and how the grain would perform for them. So that's why we're um, partnering with the Food Pilot Lab. We also have farmers who are starting their own businesses um, and marketing grain. So Silver Tree Beer and Spirits are young farmers. Uh, Will and Dallas Glazik have started their own company to add some value to their wheat. So they take a bushel of wheat, turn it into um, vodka or another product like that, and then, it, then it's worth hundreds of dollars a bushel. And their partner is Stumpy's Distillery in Columbia, Illinois. So this just shows a view of their farm and facility. The other thing that we're working on is malting. And um, this is a tough market to, to develop. But the point I want to make here is Tor Oshner, this farmer on the right and the young maltster on the left are working together in New York. And Tor had a, um, grew barley one year that had vomitoxin. So normally it would not work for malting, but he took it in to this young guy and said, is there anything you can do? And the thoughtful young man there said, let me adjust my recipes, um, do a little research and get back to you. And as it turns out, um, you can use high vomitoxin grain for malting. You just have to be flexible. So there is some potential on the malting side and um, there are some small malting companies starting or you know, ongoing in Illinois. Um, and it hopefully is something that we can develop in the future. That would be a nice large scale market for local grains. So I've, I've learned a lot about different um, uh, companies, food based companies over the past year through some meetings in Chicago. And uh, I think we have a lot to learn from these entrepreneurs that are running successful food-based businesses. So that's what you see here. This is probably not the image that comes to mind when you think about the CEO of a successful company, but they have secured millions of dollars in investment and have national distribution um, for uh, corn, corn flakes, basically, purple corn flakes, other types of cereal, mushroom farms, and herbs grown in containers. So this company is called Back to the Roots. And I met them in Chicago at a meeting, and one of the most impressive things they have done is they entered into a competition to get their cereal into the New York public school system. They were competing against General Mills, and they won. They won, they won the taste test. They got their cereal into the New York public school system. So you want to talk about scale of markets. Well, they have done it. So. Um, they're using cold to process their grain. Their cereal contains three ingredients, corn, sugar, and salt. And uh, we're trying to work with them. We're trying to, to tap into their network and experience to help with marketing um, some of our products. So we've also, we're also working with the Illinois Farm to School Network and uh, trying to break into that market. Um, we're working with Diane Chapetta at Seven Generations Ahead, and we hope to add grain um, to their Harvest of the Month selection and begin to get more grain into the Chicago public school system. We have partners like Gourmet Gorilla in Chicago, which make 20,000 meals a day, and they already are getting local grain into the system, so we, we hope to build upon that. And then after five years of work, we got um, Green Top Grocery established in Bloomington Normal. This is a cooperative grocery store that pri prioritizes supporting local, paying fair prices to farmers. 
And um, this is another example of a project where no one thought it would work and that we could do it. And now it's been operating for a year and it is working. It is not easy, um, but we've made a lot of progress and uh, it's, it's very encouraging to see the support that we have at this point. Okay, another um, company that we look to, to to sort of envision the future is Anson Mills in uh, South Carolina. And this is Glenn Roberts on the left. He's the owner, so he runs a mill and he sells flour and grains all over the world to high-end chefs. But one of the things he's doing is growing uh, polycultures, which is what we hope to do in the future. So the loaf of bread you see on the right is um, from a field where all of these crops were grown together. So they're all growing together. This is black oats, emmer, camelina, um, French rye, buckwheat, red sorghum, benny seed, uh, cow peas. So planted together, grown together, harvested, um, milled as is, and made into a loaf of bread. So this is sort of the epitome or the you know, the end goal that we would be working towards is that level of diversity on farm fields and um, people can basically buy the whole crop rotation in a single loaf of bread. So another nonprofit that we started as part of this work is called Regenerate Illinois. No one wanted to start another nonprofit, but um, we realized that no one was focusing on regenerative agriculture and this idea that agriculture can improve the health of the environment. And so we started a new group that is focused on that um, issue, promoting um, full diversity and uh, improving soil health over time. And another component of the work is um, the refuge food forest. So this is an urban demonstration site for agroforestry in uh, City Park in Normal, Illinois. So we, we're partnering with the Parks Department. And this is an aerial view of the planting, which consists of fruit trees, nut trees, raspberries, blackberries, currants, asparagus, willows, like tremendous diversity. Um, the main motivation for planting this uh, was to get kids outside eating berries. So this is a uh, this shows the the basic idea. You get kids outside when they're little, eating berries, and then as they age and continue to eat the berries, they develop an appreciation for fresh local food, and then over time they become the type of discerning customer that is willing to support local food systems. So this is taking a long term view and trying to create um, discerning customers in the future. This is my oldest son. And one drawback to doing this is that now I don't get to eat very much of the fruit that I grow because him and his brother get it all before I do because they're very discerning. One of the other crops um, that we're focusing on in the food forest are Chinese chestnuts. So this is a viable commercial crop for Illinois. Um, they produce annually. They're protect, protected by these crazy um, spines on the hull, so the squirrels can't get to them. And if you would like to learn more, you don't have to take my word for it. Just go to Red Fern Farm website. They're in Iowa. Prairie Grove Nut Growers, Route 9 Co-op, the Savannah Institute, or Chestnut Ridge. They all have information about growing chestnuts, how they manage the system, the economics of it. And so this is something that we are working towards and hoping um, to add to farms over time. The Savannah Institute mains, maintains a site um, and a map. It's called the perennial map. And that's what you're looking at here. And I just put this in here to show these are all farms or nurseries or orchards that are growing perennial plants. So this is just to show that we do have a network in place of people that are interested in perennials and we could do more with them. So a project I'm working on now to try to basically to pull all these threads together is a partnership with the Parklands Foundation, which is a land trust based in Bloomington Normal. 
So the image you see on the bottom, that's an aerial view of the Mackinac River just north of Bloomington Normal. And uh, the green represents tree cover. The Parkland Foundation owns about 3,000 acres of land along the river. It's rolling terrain. And so we are partnering with them and piloting new ways of funding farmland acquisition so that we can pilot this idea that conservation and agriculture can be mutually beneficial. We can farm in a way that actually creates habitat for wildlife um, and benefits parklands as well as the farmers. So one of the one of the ideas is, you know, the land trusts that are managing natural areas have to control exotic species and they typically will cut them out with a chainsaw and apply herbicide. Another way to do it is to use livestock to graze down um, exotic shrubs like honeysuckle. So that's what you see here. So that's one of the one of the ideas for this type of a work is this level of coordination where the land trust leases their land out to a farmer who very strategically and intensively grazes to control exotics and ultimately benefit the health of the natural system. So this is just another view of the Mackinac River. One of the other ideas that we're pursuing, um, this is an oxbow, so the river um, comes down from the top right, flows around this land, parkland zones, all of this land, which is restored prairie, and the red dots represent a potential put in and take out location where we can make it easy for people um, to get out and experience the landscape and to form a, a connection to the landscape and to the Mackinac River. So this is a view of the Mackinac in, in spring at low flow. Um, it is surprisingly beautiful and therapeutic. So it's really good for people to get out there. So we're trying to get people out, get them connected to the landscape so that they would be willing to support um, diverse farms and uh, the products that they produce. <clears throat> All right, this is a cool photo I took of a bumblebee on a, that was uh, getting pollen off of corn flowers this past summer. So um, this is my concluding slide, and I'm going to go through um, some closing thoughts here. Uh, I hope I've given you a sense of the, the progress that we've made. I um, feel like I went through it pretty quickly, but um, I have conveyed some of the main points. Um, so the next steps for us are to strengthen uh, um, our broad coalition that's currently in place and the entrepreneurs that are working to create a modern food system. Um, organizations that are on the leading edge of this movement include the Forever Green Initiative at the University of Minnesota, the Initiative for Food and Agricultural Transformation at Ohio State, and the Center for Regional Food Systems at Michigan State. So they are all taking a long-term view coupled with a comprehensive approach to building a better food system. We are going to build upon their work and incorporate more research and support for psychological, social, and logistical challenges. Our biggest barriers to success are social. They're not agronomic. Consequently, most of the work to be done needs to come from community members working for the betterment of their place. We need to find ways to help more people have well-reasoned, nuanced conversations about complex problems that move beyond the polarized debates that dominate the news and limit our thinking and understanding of what is possible. People have more in common than they realize, and the solutions to the problems that we face require compromise and finding a reasonable middle ground. We need the perspectives of people who tend to be more liberal and of the people who tend to be more conservative. The challenge for us is, is to combine the best of those perspectives in a way that allows us to find the best collective understanding of the truth. So in order to reach that goal, um, I am thinking about hosting a podcast um, based on the model exemplified by Joe Rogan and others to discuss food systems with the goal of enhancing and fostering this collective understanding. So his podcast and others have had a profound impact on me, and I think it is approach um, that can help other people. 
So if you're not familiar with podcasts or Joe Rogan, what he does is uh, he invites guests to come on a show and they discuss a complex topic over the course of an hour or three. <clears throat> and the goal is to gain a better understanding of the topic. <clears throat> so it's not a debate. <clears throat> no one is trying to win. They're just trying to um, dig deep and learn more. So I would encourage you to check out um, a Joe Rogan podcast or Zach mentioned uh, Mark Marin as another good podcast to consider and try to listen to the entire thing so you can get a sense of how complex discussions <clears throat> can be riveting and enlightening. A remarkable food related Joe Rogan podcast is his interview with Paul Stamets. So that's the first one I would recommend if you want to see um, uh, an amazing example of this, it would be uh, Joe Rogan's interview with Paul Stamets. Another compelling interview is the recent podcast with uh, Steven Pinker, um, which features a wide ranging discussion of all the positive trends that exist in the world, but are not covered by mainstream media. So both of these podcasts um, will open your mind to new ways of thinking. So if I were to do such a podcast, what I'd like to do is bring people together to have long conversations about complex food related issues. These would have the potential to liber liberate people from the confines of narrow ideological groups and open them up to more expansive viewpoints. So we have many stories in our work with farmers and we have incredible potential to combine modern technology with our improved understanding of biology and how the world works. In many ways, the task before us is relatively simple, though I'd mentioned this before. On the agronomic side, it's about minimizing tillage, keeping the soil covered with plants, and growing diverse crops. The bigger challenge um, is to find ways to focus our collective energy on optimizing that system. That is the difficult work that we all need to do, and this requires that we make a conscious effort to move out of our comfort zones. So. Much of the dialogue that we have around food and agriculture consists of trying to fit into our preferred group and that limits our ability to find solutions. So that is what we're working towards. Um, so I'll end with a practical example of why, um, why we would pursue this approach and, and what can happen. So if you think about um, all these aspiring farmers that want to gain access to more farmland, right? This is one of the primary barriers to developing a more diverse and resilient food system. And so we have all these young people who want to farm, but just can't figure out how to get access to land. So imagine if we equip them with crop budgets for diversified production and an understanding of the current conditions and stresses that conventional farmers and landowners are experiencing. So if we couple that with an enhanced understanding of human psychology and tribalism, then more aspiring farmers would be able to find land to rent. So if they were coached on how to talk to landowners, how to think of rejection as a learning opportunity, then they could refine their pitch and pursue land until they succeed. So the thing is, this might take 20 or more rejections before they succeed. And that may be normal. That may just be the way that things work. But how many farmers do you know have, that have asked 20 people um, to rent their land? Probably very few of them because people perceive rejection as failure. They get discouraged and they stop asking. It may just be that they haven't asked enough. And so if we were to help them understand that rejection is not failure, it's an opportunity to learn, and that people that embrace that perspective and couple it with growing staple crops will eventually find land to rent. And this will facilitate the development of new food systems that recognize ecological limits and align with consumer interests. Okay, so with that, I will stop and uh, hopefully I left some time for questions. If anyone has questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Bill. That was a really informative, uh, very in information dense session, very inspiring. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, one of the, a couple of them were related to those names that you mentioned the podcast. So it was Paul Stamets, right, on the Joe Rogan podcast, and Stephen Pinker, right. Those are the two names 
That's right. Mentioned. Okay. So just people just had a couple questions about that, um, just to clarify those names. I also threw in there the, the Farmer to Farmer podcast is another really good podcast. It's not focused on grains, really, but it is focused on other farming systems and conversations with, with farmers. Um, I put Bill's email in the chat box. It's W Davison at illinois.edu if you have any questions for him you can you can email him uh, any, any further questions so I do have a few questions um, that were asked and we'll, we'll just go ahead and start from the top because some of them were, were things you talked about a little while ago someone had a question about any issues with snow geese eating winter wheat before it is harvest, harvested or maybe you could just talk about uh, general uh, animal uh, predation on these grain crops if there's any any insights you have into that well there certainly are a lot of snow geese out there and they do eat grass um, I have not heard any farmers say that that's been a big problem for them um, the, the geese might eat some of it but it, it's at a point where they probably can out can continue growing after that the biggest problem that I have experienced are with deer and raccoons so if you try to grow this open pollinated corn and you're anywhere near a wooded area, the deer and the raccoons will come for this corn and they will preferentially eat that corn. And if you don't take a precautions, they will eat all of it. So they are not good at sharing. Um, they just go for it. So you do, you definitely, I probably should have mentioned that if, if you want to try to grow some of the, the corn that I talked about, you, you have to either grow it somewhere you know not near woods or you have to, to use dogs or fencing or some way to um, keep the deer and raccoons out okay someone else asked the question how do you and you sort of mentioned this in the slide before it I think with the g1a breeding work but how do you keep your corn I think they're meaning on the smaller scale from being cross-pollinated with with GMOs <clears throat> it is a it is a real challenge so my corn is about 100 day corn i mean it goes it ranges from 90 to 115 but i'm selecting for 100 day so we plant late uh, sometimes i'm planting middle of june um, this year i'm going to plant early and late but yeah so we isolate by time we isolate by distance so we just follow the same practices that a farmer would follow so we just we try to isolate it but it is a concern I did test you know I do test to, to check on that um, but that's why it's through part of the corn breeding grant we are trying to to breed that into corn crops where the the crop would literally um, reject dent corn pollen so it would be like if anyone's familiar with uh, Blue River Pure Maze, um, that's what we're trying to develop okay awesome uh, there was another question. Uh, talk you were when you were mentioning the root ex exudates from the corn plants. The, the follow-up question to this was: Does this mean that adding certain sugar enhances crop production? If so, what type? Can you maybe just ex clarify that a little bit? The the root exudate part. <clears throat> there are farmers that are um, uh, foliar spraying crops to promote general plant health. Um, I don't think it's necessary for a crop like corn um, it's more about trying to make your soil healthy and then the plant if you have the right diversity and the right types of corn the, the plants will they'll secrete you know the exudate that they need that will feed the life in the soil and develop the kind those the relationships that I was describing so they don't need they don't need sugar they'll make their own okay and then one last question that was written was a blue, well, someone just typed in Blue River. What 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 was that you just mentioned? The it's called Pyramé. So it's the line. It's the a type of corn from a company called Blue River that has this ability to reject dent corn pollen. And the farmers that grow it typically say that they have never had it contaminated. So they have figured it out. Okay, thank you uh, for that clarification. And then the final question, uh, do you work with the Netherlands? The, there was a great article about this tiny country feeding the world. Um, I'm sure they're referring to, I, I mentioned this in my pod, in my webinar about them being the number two exporter of 
certain produce items through controlled environmental agriculture. But uh, if you if there's anything you wanted to elaborate about that, feel free. Well, I did read that article, and I it was really impressive. And I think we do have a lot to learn from them. You know, just in general, not necessarily about um, indoor production, but just about modern technology and efficiency. And those are the kind of things that we're trying to to add to the work we're doing with and to help new farmers. So, it, you know, it might be an app on a phone or something that we identify through our work with the faculty at U of I where we can help farmers be more efficient. So, yeah, that was a, that was an amazing uh, article. Okay, uh, and then there was a couple of people that wanted to have links to the organizations you mentioned at the end. So I think one of them was like the Michigan uh, Food System Group. Can you can you provide uh, me some of those links, maybe via email, and I can send them out when I give, give the follow up email. I'll, I'll be glad to do that. Um, otherwise, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank Bill uh, for the fabulous presentation in this very sort of relevant and timely area of agriculture. And thanks everyone for joining the webinar. And I hope you got some good information to think about your small farm endeavors and, and how you may expand them into this this, this very interesting grain world uh, that we're that we're developing here in Illinois. Uh, look out for an email from us because this is going to be archived and we're, it's going to be on our YouTube channel. And we'll send you the link uh, with the follow up evaluation uh, along with that email as well. So hope everyone has a great day and we will uh, see you next week. <laughs>